Well, if I told you that there's a documentary about curing Tourette's that's made by a convicted cult leader. A documentary that's so manipulative that even though the people behind it are behind bars, people are still believing its message. This is a story about cults, Tourette's and manipulation. This is a difficult video for me to make. The more I dove into this rabbit hole, the more disgusted and uncomfortable it became for me to continue. But I think it's too important of an issue to not make this video. So there's this documentary. It's called My Tourette's and from the outside it looks like a beautiful hopeful documentary about a study into a new treatment that might actually cure Tourette's and that's how many people see it. But in reality this documentary is nothing like that. This documentary is as manipulative as the organization that made it. So today I want to reframe this documentary. I want to show you how this documentary is not a story of hope, but an example of how monstrous people exploit those that are most vulnerable. So first I have to talk about the people behind this so-called study. If you already know about Nexium and Keith Raniere, you know that this stuff gets dark. For those of you that don't know, I'm just going to flash some of the subjects I will briefly touch upon in the next segment on the screen. And if you don't feel like these topics are something you want to expose yourself to, I get that. And I will warn you when we get into these topics. You can go to this timestamp to skip to the next part in which I'll discuss the documentary itself. I do want to talk about these issues though, because it's easy to get lost in the pretty picture the documentary presents, but by keeping in mind who the actual people are that are behind this, it's easier to look past this narrative. Okay, let's begin. Part 1. The people behind My Tourette's. The My Tourette's documentary shows that treatment practice of Tourette's by Nancy Saltzman and Keith Raniere. And Keith Raniere is the founder of an MLM called Nexium. MLMs or multi-level marketing companies are often thought of as pyramid schemes, but contrary to pyramid schemes, MLMs are actually legal. And the difference between a pyramid scheme and an MLM is that MLMs sell a product. The products that Nexium sold were personal and professional developmental seminars through the executive success programs, which were large group awareness training things, with co-founder Nancy Saltzman, who was a former psychiatric nurse, and these trainings were a scam. In one article it says that recruits paid more than $7,500 for grueling 12-hour intensive featuring Nexium's patented Executive Success Program technology. A patchwork of various self-help programs, religious ideologies and hypnosis techniques. And from the outside it was clear that these techniques used in these workshops were nothing new and only loosely based on science at most, but the people that were in it seemed extremely enthusiastic. They felt enlightened. And not because the material was that good, but because Nexium operated like a cult. Keith Raniere is a master manipulator and cult leader. He has a way about him that makes people want to follow him. And once they were in his grip, horrible things happened. This is a quote of Mark Ficenti, who is a former member of Nexium, and he testified, By the time you saw him, it was a little like he was seeing some kind of a god. He testified that many people joined Nexium to better themselves or promote good in the world. They ended up being exploited. It's a fraud, it's a lie, Vicente said, choking up. It's this well-intended veneer that covers horrible, incredible evil. I 
won't go over everything this man and this organization have done. There are many great articles and documentaries about it, but I will talk about some of the things that I think are important to show what type of thing we're really dealing with here. And this is the trigger warning part. If you don't want to hear about the subjects I talked about in the intro, skip to the timestamp you see on the screen now, all right? All right. One, the company was a recruiting platform for a secret society called DOS, in which women were forced into sexual slavery. And part of the initiation of this group was actual branding, like they branded women, like, like cattle. They were told that the branding symbolized something like the elements, but they later found out that they were actually branded with the initials of Keith Raniere. And in an article, it explains that there was a method to the branding. It was supposed to be precisely seven strokes, one line across and two diagonal lines down to form the sideways K. Then four smaller lines to form the sideways R beneath, the little spoon to the big spoon of the K. And the women were supposed to be naked. They were supposed to be videotaped. They were supposed to be held down on a table, arms above the head, legs spread, ankles and wrists bound, helpless, vulnerable, exposed. And they were supposed to say the following, please brand me, it will be an honor. An honor I want to wear for the rest of my life. This last, this last part was the most important. They should probably say that before they're held down, so it doesn't seem like they were being coerced. Keith Raniere told actress Alison Mack, his lover, disciple and slave. Okay, Mack responded in a soft voice. She already knew most of this because she had already been branded. Later, Veneri instructs Mac what to tell the women unwittingly being branded with his initial. Pain is how we know how much we love. We know the depth of our love through pain. When they feel the pain, they think of that love. 2. Some of the women Veneri exploited were children. This is what one person remembered from when she encountered Veneri when she was just 12 years old. One woman whose name is being withheld for this story was just a girl in 1990. A 12 year old with feather bangs and long blonde hair who was trying to adjust to a new life following her parents' divorce. Her mother was a saleswoman for Raniere's members only buying club, Consumers Byline Inc. That was one of his earlier MLMs and was trying to raise two daughters. She recalled her mother saying Raniere was an Einstein. When Raniere offered free tutoring, the girl's mother jumped at the opportunity. He was supposed to teach her Latin and algebra. Instead, she said he told her she hugged like a child. Her arms wrapped around him, but her hips pushed away. He taught her to hug the way adults do, pelvis to pelvis. The girl liked being able to hang out with Raniere and the women around him. She thought sex was just a part of fitting in. They told me I was smart and took an interest in me. They let me spend every afternoon at their house. It was exciting to be somewhere where people wanted me. I was perfect picking, insecure at the time. To have someone that mature and that well thought of to be interested in me, it was flattering. I was young, inexperienced, overwhelmed, out of my league. Three. The court documents for the case against Ranieri and Swordsman have an entire section about illegal experimentation on a human being. This is part of that court document. At least 40 members of the Nexium community, trusting in Ranieri, Nancy Swordsman and Dr. Brandon Porter, were subjected to a human fright experiment in which individuals were seated in front of a video display with EEG electrodes on their skulls to measure brain waves. These subjects believed that they were going to watch a talk by Ranieri, but were instead subjected to scenes of escalating violence, including actual extremely graphic footage of the brutal beheading and dismemberment of five women in Mexico. 
So in short, Keith Raniere and Nancy Saltzman are not nice, helpful people. Keith Raniere was convicted of federal crimes including sex trafficking of children, conspiracy and conspiracy to commit forced labour. And he was sentenced to 120 years in prison. Nancy Saltzman was sentenced to 42 months in prison and a $150,000 fine for racketeering conspiracy. And it's important that we keep these facts in mind because now we're going to look into that documentary. Part two, reframing the documentary. All documentaries lie. The problem with documentaries is that sometimes people think that because it is a documentary, it must be 100% unfiltered truth. And with the current state of things, I think that more and more people are becoming aware that documentaries aren't always true, but subconsciously there's still this assumption. And you have to understand that every piece of media is filtered, it's framed and edited in a specific way to convey a message. For everything a video, a news article, documentary shows, there are decisions made to show one thing and not show another thing. And these techniques can be used to make a story more interesting, to be more informing, to seduce you, to buy something, to convince you of something, or to manipulate you. And why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because it'll make it easier to see what this documentary tries to do. The documentary is made up of four parts. The intro, the setup, the solution, and the aftermath. And I'm going to really pick apart the intro because it's skillfully crafted to direct your emotions subconsciously. And it's going to get a bit technical, so hang in there. I, I think it's really important that we are on the same page. And after that, I'll go over the rest of the documentary with far broader strokes. But as we're doing this, remember the people behind it. These people were really good at manipulating people. So let's see if they can trick us too. The intro starts with a message. And before we even go into watching it, let's look at this frame. And remember, all documentaries lie. What do you see? There's a welcome man in a suit standing in front of a bookcase. There's an American flag in the background. This is not by accident. This was scripted. There's decisions being made. The shot in front of bookcase is something we often see in documentaries and news items where some expert is talking. The books are stacked neatly, but not too neatly. We're supposed to think that these books are actually being read and the books are all about arts and culture. So we're dealing with a well-read, cultured man here. The man is wearing a blue suit, white shirt, red tie. This conveys a sense of stability, maturity, calmness. Even though the things he will say may sound wild, this is not a wild man. And look, he is wearing the same colors as the American flag that just happens to be in the shop. Now, as a non-American, this idea of putting flags everywhere is always a bit jarring for me to see, but in any culture, a flag is a symbol, but especially the American flag in American cultures symbolizes more than just politics. Our flag has become a symbol above politics. It's the symbol of that which unites us, says John Hartvigsen, the president of the North American Vexillological Association, or NAVA, and Vexillology... <laughs> Vexillo... Vexillology is the study of flags, apparently. So this whole setup symbolizes that this calm, cultured, smart man is the embodiment of a patriot. He cares about the people and we can trust him. Now, I just want to point out the random FBI book that's there as well. I don't know, made me giggle a bit. <laughs> now let's hear about what he has to say. My name is Mark Elliott. I lived with a severe case of Tourette syndrome for 20 years and eventually became an award-winning inspirational speaker, traveling internationally to raise awareness about compassion and Tourette's. What you're about to see will challenge traditional medical knowledge about Tourette syndrome and potentially many other neurological disorders. What you'll witness is an unconventional, safe, new, non-invasive, non-meditative, non-hypnotic, and entirely talk-based therapy that has had a dramatic impact on the lives of a small group of people living with Tourette syndrome. 
Oh wow, that sounds amazing. And with that inspirational music. I just want to point out that he slips the non-hypnotic part in there just because Nexium has been accused of using hypnosis quite a bit. So let's continue. What you're about to see will also challenge another narrative about the group and the person behind this medical breakthrough, Nexium and Keith Raniere. Currently, Keith Raniere is serving a 120 year prison sentence. Nexium has been cast by the media and the government as an evil sex cult Oh, here we go. Evil sex cold. This film gives people a window into Nexium and the man behind it. Again, an interesting shot showing Raniere bathing in light, small, through a group of people who all seem to trust him. Almost makes you want to forget the pelvis to pelvis hug, right? I feel sick. This film gives people a window into Nexium and the man behind it that the government doesn't want you to see. Something the government doesn't want you to see. Is that the FBI way, Mark? Yeah. Because I'm sure all the governments of all the countries are in cahoots because fuck those kids with Tourette's, right? Because governments are really good at working together and keeping secrets. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just getting worked up watching this face. <clears throat> in fact, the government threatened to prosecute me for simply sharing my story, which you will soon get to see firsthand. There's a reason he says this. It gives an impression that he sacrificed something in order to give you the truth. And he now asks you to do something for him in return. Just a small thing. All I want you to do is enjoy this film and carefully review it. Don't mind if I do. Truth films. Bit on the nose in my opinion, but... Even this serif font, that's when the letters have the little feet, is usually used to convey trust. So, why would they show this quote? I'm inclined to think it's to plant a seed of fear. This could happen to anyone. And then using the name Oliver Sacks, who is a famous neurologist, to convey a sense of authority, even though that, that man has nothing to do with this film and is actually very dead. These sentences are taken from the Tourette's Association of America, but are absolutely taken out of context. The TEA words it as such. There is no cure for Tourette's syndrome, but thanks to years of dedicated research, there are various treatment options. Slight difference in tone, eh? <laughs> the information is not factually incorrect, but the way it's said changes how you feel about it. Now that we all know the people behind this thing and are aware of how they want your mindset to be before the film even started, we are finally ready to get into the actual documentary. So during the first half of the documentary, we're introduced to several young individuals who all have Tourette's. I want to make clear that I don't have anything against any of the people with Tourette's or their families in this documentary. We see people that are truly suffering from their Tourette's and who haven't had a positive experience with medication. These situations are very real and are issues that do need attention. For most people, their Tourette's is not as debilitating. For many, it fades away after childhood, and many people do find great relief from medication. For some, that isn't the case, and it makes sense that they are willing to look anywhere for treatment. Alright? So, we meet our participants. A lot of this is very similar to other documentaries you may have seen on Tourette's or, you know, other disabilities, stuff like that. The shots are actually quite beautiful and the people seem very kind and interesting. These introductions all follow a certain pattern. We learn about the lives and interests of these people. We learn about their struggle with Tourette's. Not just the struggles of the participants themselves, but also the suffering of their families. We learn about the things they've tried to tackle their Tourette's and how nothing has helped. Because this part of the documentary is quite long, slow and emotional, it's easy to forget the intro and background of what we're watching. And it also helps set up a narrative. And it's a narrative of fear, guilt and mistrust of the medical field. The fear and guilt bit is it's quite jarring. We didn't know what was going on in her head, but she would 
just freeze and stop and try to block out all the external sensations. Oh boy. It's hard. Hard, 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 you know, knowing that I brought a child into this world that has to deal with these challenges. This fear is then directed towards the medical field. Many people are hesitant to give medication to young people, especially those with invisible disorders. Of course, often Tourette's is more visible than, say, ADHD or depression, but the cause of the disorder is very much invisible. Someone with Tourette's doesn't look sick, right? And the documentary plays in on that. Around the nine minute mark, the mother of one of the people we just met explains how their child had tried several medications, but that these were not effective. Unfortunately, we found out very quickly that from as we went from one medication to the next, that the treatments aren't perfect. There aren't even, at that time, there wasn't even a specific medication for Tourette syndrome. They're not even a specific medication for Tourette syndrome. This suggests that there is no effective treatment at all for Tourette's and that children with Tourette's are just given loads of strong and useless medication. And this is, of course, not how it is. You know, it was for heart condition. It was for high blood pressure. It was for depression. The handful of pills trope is one we see a lot in, in many documentaries and it plays into the pills are bad idea. And there are loads of these types of scenes. So we were willing to do whatever, but the medications depressed him so much that we respected that about him and he really wasn't him. The first treatment was a blood pressure medication to relax him. From there, we went to a few different seizure medications, advanced to Valium and uh, medications like that, so he would just be out of it, basically. You take the drugs and they dumb you down, so you're not you. <laughs> now, I don't want to belittle the experience that many people have with medication. Tourette's medication can be a lot and they aren't perfect. And it's absolutely valid to not want to take those medications, especially if the side effects aren't worth it. However, that does not mean that the whole medical field is just made out of evil doctors that want to chemically lobotomize your child for financial gain instead of actually curing them. These meds can and do really help a lot of people. They are not something to take lightly, but they're nothing to be scared of. And that's not how this documentary wants you to think. Here, fear is used as a motivator. Fear for a disorder, fear for medication, and fear to engage with a child with tics. Many of these are legitimate fears, but the problem with fear is that when it guides you, you become vulnerable to make bad decisions and trust the wrong people. Setup done, we are sad, we are scared, and we're mistrusting. Time to transition into a solution, right? We now meet someone we've actually seen before. If you remember, it's Mark Elliott, the inspirational speaker. He is presented as an example, something to strive towards. We learn about an event where Mark was kicked off a bus because of an N-word tick, and we see this news item. Now this is awful, and I can only imagine how scary that must have been. It should not have happened like this. And if you've watched any of my previous videos, you know that I think it's really important to talk about these issues and spread awareness so that these situations won't have to escalate like this. But why is it in this documentary? Is it to spread awareness? Doesn't seem like it. After half an hour of setup showing the suffering of the participants, this is an accumulation of the fears, proof of the worst case scenario. And they reinforce that mistrust of the medical field. He was just really determined to get a handle on his Tourette's. And um, he wanted the doctor to really um, ramp up this one medication that uh, they thought would work. And um, 
Mark tried it for a, a week or two and got to the point where um, he couldn't even function. And I'm in the office and I'm in front of the man with the white coat and this doctor says to me, you have Tourette syndrome, a neurological genetic disorder that's involuntary and has no cure. So what do you think I did as a little kid? I believed him. I believed him. This again underlines the idea that doctors are just out to betray you. With all of this, we are now properly prepped to accept the solution. Ready for some sugary, sweet inspiration porn? I remember the day that he called me and said, bro, I think I can overcome this. We went to a burger place down in Chelsea in Manhattan. Um, we got burgers and uh, we were just walking around the city and he wasn't ticking. And I didn't quite, I didn't quite understand it. He was different. He was absolutely different and he was not ticking anywhere near I had ever seen him. And I didn't know, I didn't know what to, to say. I mean, it, it was, it was unbelievable. I, could, I couldn't believe it. So how did Mark do it? How did he solve this? Easy. He just talked to our favorite people, Nexium. Mark meets Nancy Saltzman and she just knew that she could help him. Now, Saltzman claims that she knows nothing about Tourette's, but as a psychiatric nurse, I would expect her to know the basics. And this is just my theory, but I would not be surprised if they based their treatment on existing therapies knowingly. But at the same time, there are loads of instances where they don't seem to know anything about the disorder or, for example, the point where they were baffled by the combination of Tourette's and OCD. Um, she had certain patterns that were a combination of Tourette's and OCD that I hadn't seen in anyone, where she had superstitions, I called them, of how she had to behave in order for the tick to be ended. Even though a quick Google search would have told you that the combination of OCD and tick disorders are extremely common. But we are supposed to believe that Saltzman has this unbelievable insight that would cure Tourette's. And what was this amazing insight that she had? Mark came to us, and the head trainer, who was very astute, began to notice that there were certain things going on that were affecting his tics and reducing the number of tics he was having and the severity of tics. And I noticed that when he felt more stressed, he behaved one way, and less stressed, he behaved another way. And when he was really, you know, on his game, he wasn't having a lot of vocal tics or any tics. Now, this is nothing new. Stress often makes ticks worse. Being focused or engaged relieves ticks. Like, we know this. But this made Swordsman believe that Tourette's is just a mindset. And how do you stop that mindset? By gaslighting them into being cured. I'm not, I'm not joking. And we kept chatting for a little bit. And I was trying to explain to her she had no idea how hard it was for me. She had no idea what it's like to live in my body, to live and deal with these feelings on the inside. And as I'm saying this to her, she looked around the room and there was a couple other people in the room and she said, it's hard for everybody. What the actual fuck? It's like, you are doing this to people. You are being a bother by having this thing. And it completely puts the previous bits in a new light. Like, at first, you just see a caring family, right? But now it's put into a light of, if you don't do this method, you are hurting everyone around you. This is extremely harmful. And it was at that moment that I realized that I wasn't special anymore. That the thing that I never took into account was that everybody struggles. And that everyone is dealing with something, but for some reason, I thought that somehow my struggle was more important than other people's struggle. I wasn't special anymore. This is the toxic idea that people with disabilities only deserve being treated respectfully because their disability makes them special. It doesn't. 
We're not asking for special treatment. We're asked to be treated like humans. We're not special human beings that deserve exceptions to normal social rules because we're different. We are normal human beings that have a disorder. And of course, this disorder impacts the people around us as well. But that does not mean we inflicted this pain on them. And if this is hard to grasp, I, I want you to watch this part. And imagine it's about someone who is paralyzed and who's asked for certain accommodations. If you or someone close to you has a disorder that is impactful in any way, if you've suffered from depression, imagine that this bit is about how that disorder does not make you special and that everyone is suffering because of you. It's disgusting. Now, I'm not saying that that moment was not impactful for Mark. It could be that because of his experience with doctors, he had created this idea that he was completely hopeless, that he suffered from something so grand that that was all he was. From the way it's portrayed in his documentary, it seems that Mark really identified with his disorder, that Tourette's was what made him something inspirational, even though he was completely at the mercy of it. And maybe this conversation made him realize that he was more than his tics and that that helped him to do something he didn't think he was capable of, like not ticking. And I can imagine that being a beautiful moment and I love that for him. However, we didn't start with Mark's story. The way that this documentary is laid out, we know that this isn't about Mark's journey on coping with his Tourette's. No, it's how Tourette's can be cured, how if you don't do this, you are hurting everyone around you. Look at how these people are hurting their poor families. Now the medical field does not want you to know about this. And the introduction perfectly frames this narrative. If there was another introduction, something like, this is the story of how one person had a beautiful journey that helped him manage the ticks that had impacted his life. Maybe even the current treatment for Tourette's is incomplete, even though medication can be great for many people and other treatments are available. For some, none of these treatments work. We want to have more thorough understanding of the disorder and think that this is an interesting avenue for research. Even if that treatment is no good, it's a great way to start a discussion. But no, they portray the medical field as this rigid monster that doesn't want you to know the truth. And they have the magical elixir for everyone. They even weaponize the conviction of that guy as proof that there's a conspiracy. And there will be scared parents that will believe this nonsense. Keith Raniere, scientist. He was not a scientist, by the way. He's a criminal. Throughout history, we've had all different people with all different types of bodies, all different types of nervous systems, all different types of uh, pluses and minuses. So if you have a person that has some predisposition or something that you might call Tourette's or whatever, Something that you might call Tourette's or whatever. That's a nice way to diminish a diagnosis, Keith. That's hardwired in genetically and maybe reinforced by nurture. So you have this firmware complex. The question is, can the person consciously learn to program it so they can have what they want in the world? And to give the person a type of not only awareness, but a type of mastery over their vehicle, if we can truly do that, it's wonderful. Keith, my God, reinforced by nurture. This makes it sound like it's a parenting problem. The fact that Tourette's is not just a genetic disorder, but also influenced by external factors does not just mean parented wrong. I just released a video about the, the genetics and other causes of Tourette's. So if you're interested in that, I'll link it in the card above. So they talk about awareness and mastery over, over ticks, and this is nothing new. There is a medically researched and proven treatment that focuses on awareness. It's called CBIT. Again, I have a video about that as well, but this isn't new. So finally, at this point, the participants join the study and they really want to make you think that this is an actual scientific study. <laughs> What Keith Ranieri and I have been doing since we got together 16 years ago was 
to see if we could get reproducible, consistent, verifiable, quantifiable results, because that's what makes something a science. So I'm always looking for, can we create consistency? So in the Tourette study, for me, um, my objective was to get results with five people and then try to teach it to someone else. That's not how science works, though. Like, where's the study design, the paper, the control group? This was not a scientific study, but we are made to believe this. They even put an EEG cap on the participants, even though it doesn't really come back later on, but it makes it look more science-y, right? And the actual treatment parts that's being shown is very vague. We just see the participants with their EEG caps on, talking to Nancy. And for something that's supposed to be a great insight for the medical field, the whole thing is just incredibly vague. And the documentary explains it like this. We don't use any drugs. The only thing that we use is a talk approach. I listen to where I think that their beliefs are limited and I work with their beliefs so that they have a more reality-based way of thinking about what's going on for them. And then I look at the stimulus response patterns that they have and I systematically go for the stimulus response patterns and disconnect them. The thing that our technology does very, very well and very consistently is it disconnects stimulus response patterns. Yeah, that's really clear, isn't it? <laughs> I have no idea what they're doing. So the methods of the executive success programs were loosely based on CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a legitimate, but not new, <laughs> therapy form. They did not make this up. And NLP, which is neuro-linguistic programming, which is a pseudoscience. But again, also not new. But it's put together in a way that doesn't really make any sense. But because it's loosely based on some existing science, it's even more dangerous. Because from the outside, it can look legit. If you just take this documentary at face value, you might think that whatever they did, it worked. But again, this isn't the case. This is part of the testimonial of one of the participants in the trial against Veneri. When I was told that I was a candidate for the participation in the Nexium Tourette study, I believed that it was a legitimate medical study and I was hopeful that this study would help me with my Tourette. In fact, there was no medical screening in advance for participation and I was given no information about the study or its risks. No one informed me that the study in fact required me to take ESP intensives. I had no clue that I was going to be required to take expensive intensives that went on from 8 a.m. to 7 to 9 p.m., but that as a result, I would be obligated to Claire Bronfman. I felt like the weight of the world was on my shoulders because I needed to overcome my Tourette's in order to prove that this treatment worked. I had to resist the urge to tick at all costs because I was so afraid to tick and mess up the study, which they told me would also mess up a cure for Tourette's and potentially other medical conditions that Nexium wanted to cure. On two occasions while I was in Albany, Nancy and Mark threatened to send me home. They each mentioned that if I don't start acting better and trying harder, I will have wasted thousands of dollars of Claire's money that she had spent on me and their medical experiment. It was scary, but I couldn't show that because showing fear means something is wrong and I need to be fixed. The study these people did, did nothing for me except ruin my self-esteem, ruin my mental health and make me hate myself. It did not cure my Tourette's in any way. When you hear this, it's not so hard to understand why the documentary is so vague. Apart from the snippets from this weird talk therapy, we only see the testimonials of the participants each day. It kind of looks like one of those MTV real life shows, <laughs> but like in a, in a horrible cult way, I don't know. And just remember what we just heard from the testimony of one of the participants, right? Hear these lines, because I think they're just chilling. I worked with Nancy today, and um, it was a little frustrating because <laughs> I kept 
trying to give her answers, but I didn't know the answers. And that was a really good day. And yesterday was good. I mean, I've been doing well. I've been doing a lot better, for sure. I'm trying to avoid pain and uncomfortability. That's what I'm always trying to do. I know that who wants to be uncomfortable, but um, obviously it's a part of life. It was a tough day. It was a good one. Um, I, I had uh, an integration kind of session with Nancy. We kind of went in circles for a while, which isn't good. Um, <laughs> but tomorrow will be better. I don't know, last night I was at dinner and I was doing really well, like really well. And I was like breaking rules and all this stuff. And I was thinking like, can I say I have Tourette's anymore? I was wondering. And honestly, today I don't know if I can. Maybe just a bunch of little bad habits I have to break. But it's still kind of scary. Yeah, and I talked with my dad last night for like 20 minutes. I, I, had, I really hadn't talked to him the whole time I've been here. And it was really good. <laughs> yeah. So I've been able to be talking. And I don't think I would feel comfortable telling anyone from now on that I have Tourette's. But we are made to believe that they did something incredible. Let's listen to Keith's last words on this. To go against what is common wisdom, to go against what is common treatments, and do something that, that seems so benign. Um, it's scary because if it works, as I said, it's, it's, it's almost scarier if it works because then it raises questions. And our society doesn't do so well with questions. They like ans answers a lot better. You know, questions like, okay, what is the nature of Tourette's? How could you do something that's essentially a talk therapy that changes a, a condition like this so dramatically? Is the condition real, some people will say? Are the medications just fake? I mean, uh, it questions all of these things. And unfortunately, it doesn't really question these things, but those questions will be asked. Uh, really, what the question is, is does this sort of thing help an individual? He, he's not only claiming that they found a legitimate, new, amazing cure for Tourette's, but also imply that current medical treatments are not aimed at actually finding a cure or a treatment. All documentaries lie, but this one does it dangerously. It manipulates those that are vulnerable, pretends to be scientific, and it's done by people who have committed horrible crimes. Even though Keith Raniere and Nancy Saltzman have been convicted, there are still people that strongly support this so-called study. And even though they are not able to do this anymore, there will always be people that prey on people when they are in their most vulnerable state. And that's why I think spreading awareness about Tourette's and legitimate treatment options is so important. When people know where to go when they are in this situation, when the medical field, not just the Tourette specialists, become better at recognizing Tourette's, when society at large understands Tourette's, these people and their families, and those that watch a documentary like this and feel convinced that this is a good thing, will be better equipped to not fall for these tactics. Now, I understand that this documentary may have given a sense of hope to people dealing with Tourette's. And my intent for this video is not to take away that hope. The fact that most of the good parts of the treatments are based on existing science-based treatments means that there are treatment options out there. Treatment done by professionals who have the skills to actually help you. If you've made it to this point, thank you. This was not, <laughs> this was not an easy video for me to make, but it's an important one. If you want to help me spread this message, please share this video and let me know in the comments what your thoughts are. Anyways, I, I hope you're well wherever you are and I hope to see you again soon. Bye.